In this next video, we want to look at properties of ideal gas mixtures. We're going to start by looking at pressure, volume, and temperature. These in a pure ideal gas would be described by the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. I want to still be able to use that same concept, but I'm going to assume that my ideal gases each continue in the presence of other gases to behave as an ideal gas and totally ignore the other gases around them. Now this will be the Dalton model that we are going to use. And the idea is that, so let's say I have air and it's uh, roughly 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen. Okay? If that's the case, then what, one fifth of the molecules, every fifth molecule is going to be oxygen. If I just imagined that this was my volume here, this screen, and the nitrogen suddenly went away, and just the oxygen was alone in this space, I could figure out the pressure that would be exerted by those oxygen molecules by using the ideal gas law, nRT over V equals the pressure. Okay. Well, now then, let's imagine that the nitrogen comes back and the oxygen disappears. That nRT over V also is going to be a pressure due to the nitrogen. If I look at these two separately, then I have the partial pressure. The partial pressure of oxygen, number of molecules of oxygen, times RT over V, and partial pressure of nitrogen, moles of nitrogen, times RT over V. And the sum of those would be an indication of what I expect the total pressure to be. Now, the number of moles of substance I divided by the total number of moles is Y. And so I end up that this partial pressure can, of course, be calculated in this way. But if I know the mole fraction times the pressure, that is the partial pressure. And if I add the partial pressures up for all my substances, I get the total pressure. Okay. Now this is great. It works. It only works as long as I use mole fractions. Why we needed that last video. Now I can also evaluate other properties. U, H, and S are the ones we most often want. Sometimes we want specific heats. These quantities are carried by the molecules. And so it's much more significant to use the number of molecules. Okay? So mole fractions are the desired way of calculating these various energy and entropy quantities. Okay, so your textbook uses an overbar to indicate that I have the mole version of the energy or entropy. And if I multiply for each component by the mole fraction, I can come up with the specific enthalpy of the mixture or the specific internal energy or the specific heat or the specific entropy. If I want to relate these to the mass version, I'm just going to multiply by the molecular mass of the substance, the general mixture, correct? Your textbook also gives a little summary table of if you really do want to work on a mass basis, what I need to do there where the molecular mass figures into the equations, how to calculate the various things. Okay? And you'll notice that it starts getting a little bit more complicated. Okay? It's just easiest to work on a mole basis when I do mixtures. So if I want to analyze some problems, basically all I need to do is solve them as if I were working the first or second law for any other problem. Since I'm assuming ideal gases, all I need to do is use ideal gas properties on a mole basis 
and mole fractions, and I can get the correct answers that I'm looking for. So here's just one little example. Okay, I have an ideal gas, gas mixture, 10 kilomoles of this ideal gas mixture. It's 85% CO2, 15% CO. Initially, it's at 600 Kelvin and 2 bar, and it's compressed to 650 Kelvin and 10 bar. I want to find the internal energy change, the enthalpy change, and the entropy change. So I need to gather data at 600 Kelvin and 650 Kelvin from the ideal gas tables for CO2 and CO. In your textbook, this is what it looks like. I chose 600 and 650, so the top line in the pink and the top line in the white. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, these are units of kilojoules per kilomole or kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. And I have H bar, U bar, and S bar for each of these. So I just find the appropriate values off these tables and then multiply by mole fractions to come up with my changes in U. So 85% was CO2, so I take the delta U for CO2. 15% was CO, I take the delta U for CO. And then this is kilomoles of the total mixture. That's the number of moles I'm going to multiply by. And I end up with units of kilojoules per kilomole times kilomoles. And I have 18 and a half megajoules is my delta U. Similarly, for delta H, I'm just going to do this using H2 minus H1 for each substance. Multiply again by the mole fractions and the moles. Entropy is a little bit trickier because I have to go through and use the um, S not, remember this is the temperature only portion of delta S, and then I subtract off R ln of P2 over P1, the pressure dependent portion of delta S. So I can do that for each one of these times the mole fraction of this, same times the mole fraction of CO, whole thing multiplied by the mass, and I get ni negative 98 kilojoules per, kil per kelvin. But I want to point out one other thing here. The pressure dependent portion did not depend on what the substance was. It's just R ln of P2 over P1. So I could do the temperature dependent portions times their mass or mole fractions, and then at the end subtract off 8.314 times ln of 10 over 2 and come up with a delta little s. I would still at the end need to multiply by this. But so you'll see the pressure dependent portion done in different ways because the pressure dependent portion depends on number of molecules but not on the actual substance being used. So as long as I'm using moles I can do this for the entire substance all at once.